Okay, welcome to the Futures Edge podcast. It's the first Friday of the month, so we have Mike Arnold, Chief Technical Strategist for Path Trading Partners as our guest, which is always one of my favorite shows because he always teaches me something I don't know. But we always have co-hosts and brains behind the operation, Bob Iaccino. And today, okay, we're, we're, this is a technical show, the first Friday of the month, but we need to talk about this. It's time to call bullshit on these numbers. Today is Friday. Yeah. We saw the NFP number today. Yeah. It came in as a surprising beat. Before I'm going to throw this to you, our mutual friend, Steph Pomboy, sent me a note pretty much immediately saying, this, this is weird. The last two months alone, the headline institutional, I mean, the uh, establishment number, as we call it, is up 560,000 jobs. The household survey is down 460,000 jobs. In two months, a million job divergence. Um, when that's ever happened in the past, when it resolves itself, it resolves itself to the household survey. Also, uh, hourly earnings were up, scary. Hours worked were down, which is usually the first thing to happen before we really start losing jobs. But what the hell is going on with this? <laughs> I, will, I can only tell you that one of the things that why I started questioning before you told me about Steph's note and then I saw her tweets Um the thing that I pulled out, and Mike Arnold does, I don't know, 200 live webcasts a day on the Path Trading Partners YouTube channel. It's like one every four and a half seconds. And he invited me on the one this morning to talk about the non-farm payrolls number because I suspect he saw something weird there too. The one thing that jumped out at me in the numbers, it's November and we lost 30,000 retail jobs. And the immediate excuse was there must be a problem with the seasonal uh, adjustments. Stop with the seasonal adjustments. We all know it's Christmas. We all know it's Hanukkah. We all know there's gift buying coming and the stores are going to get busy, whether online or otherwise. So if the reason we lost 30,000 retail jobs is because of a seasonal adjustment that goes to the core of what Steph is talking about. These numbers are garbage. There's absolute garbage. And I'll add another thing, too, is that I... I can't figure out, which is just is run of the mill garbage because government has a difficult time tabulating actual data or there's something nefarious about it. If it's the latter, it's bad because why would you want to sit around and pat yourself on the back right now? We just had an election you know, four weeks ago. This is the time to own, own up if you're as corrupt as I sometimes think that they are. There's nothing to gain by this because it's going to rectify itself. We're going to notice that, oh, we weren't in a great job market. It's going to be a hell of a lot long time before the next election. And the Fed, who is, is seems to be looking at the establishment number and going to be raising, although the market did kind of uh, realize halfway through the day today that perhaps the Fed is not as dumb as we think and understand that the labor market's cracking. But I was going to say is if you're going to be corrupt it's not even good corruption they should hire guys like us we would lead them in better paths of corruption oh, right we would absolutely crush the corruption <laughs> thing if they asked us to i mean at least we'd do it the right way no doubt about I'm it i'm not including mike in that by the way it's just the two guys with the vowels on the end of the right night. he's not even italian right no he's not even italian so I don't know, Mike, what do you think? I mean, you wanted me on to comment on the numbers because you thought they were weird. You didn't think they were run of the mill. Well, the, the, the numbers just watch. January with the big adjustment, it's going to get all rectified in January. <laughs> and then we're going to see all the triple counting, quadruple counting of jobs because people are holding 16 jobs to try to make inflation go away. You know, and it's all going to get seasonally adjusted because the household survey counts. If you have three or four jobs, you can count an employee once. The other one counts four separate jobs. Well, really, if you have four 10-hour jobs, you're only working 40 hours a week. Right. So. Let me add to that real quick. If not, any of you watching have not seen Trading Places, I know everyone here has that's on this podcast right now. There's a line in there where Eddie Murphy says, you know, and I got to get the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip because Christmas is coming. Something's funny. It seems to me that that might have something to do with it. I mean, you I don't know how you make an individual confident with data who isn't making ends meet, but that could be the only part of the uh, theoretical, not not assumed theoretical corruption in the data is to say we got to make people feel comfortable with with it so they spend over Christmas so we can, I don't know. I mean, I- By the way, I do think, you know, these retail numbers that we've seen too, and the retail sales number, which I'd like to hit on that too, because that was kind of a bullshit number as well. 
you know, a lot of it was, some of it was Hurricane Ian spending, some of it was inflation spending that made it beat too. But um, uh, the retail numbers, I, I think there's a change in psychology that's happened since lockdowns. And there's like a YOLO shit going on where people are going to spend money that they don't have. Credit card spending backs that up. Personal savings rates going down backs that up. I think there's something to that. They're like, damn it. I, I gave up two and a half years of my life. I'm not going to let my kid down this Christmas. We're having a big Christmas, big food, big presents. What do you think? Before we go to the charting, Mike, do you happen to have that Fred chart handy if I give you the screen? Remember the one we yeah. talked about, about uh, the savings rate? Yeah. And there it is relative to history. Jim, you're not going to believe it. I mean, we know the savings rate is suffering. And we know from our conversations with uh, Cameron Dawson and Emma Moolman that the lower end of the socioeconomic strata suffers first. But when you look at the total savings rate, if, if Mike can pull this up, Mike, I'm going to give yeah, you. Okay, let me give Mike uh, control of the screen here. You're not going to believe how bad it is. All right, let's see. Multiple participants can share. I am so quick as the producer and brains behind the outfit. Mike, go ahead. Whenever you're ready, put it up. There. Oh, oh. oh, no. Well, oh, I was just kidding about that brains behind the operation bullshit. You know right. that, right? Don't take it seriously, Bob. <laughs> right. Look Holy at the level. Crap. Look, Look at, at the level of the savings rate. This is going back to 1960. It's actually pre-1960. It's going back to 1959. Look at that. Look at the level. Mike, can you yeah. highlight the lows? I mean, the low. We only have ever had one print lower than it was now, and that was back in on, on July. One single print. July 2005 was 2.1 before it started climbing. We are at 2.3 right now. That's October. Where do you think November is going to be? Yeah. I, I This is the last hurrah for the consumer. I've talked to a lot of people they're they're still going all they're still ever since lockdowns ended the summer was vacation and party mode and this is going to be a blast holiday system season and then they'll deal with the ramifications come january and the yeah. ramifications jimmy are going to be awful i mean i, I didn't know it was this low again we did this in the live stream on pat trading partners uh, a couple days ago we looked at this and uh well, it couldn't be a couple of days ago because it's updated December 1st. I think it was yesterday afternoon. But again, we're recording on Friday, nearing the close of the markets here. Look how low that is. I mean, it's incredible yeah. that it dropped that low from where it was. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I'm giving I mean, a... Uh, you go if you take the last 10 years, even, look at this. <laughs> Lowest level in yeah. 10 years. I mean, by which by the way, can, can you, do you also have a, a credit card? Um uh, spending chart as well because i saw those two put together once and if you guys want to talk gives... about other things i'll look for it here in the background while you guys are going over charts yeah, uh, oh bobby i want to tell you too and you can just listen as well i'm giving a speech thursday morning at a semiconductor suppliers conference um they asked me to speak and basically the topic is going to be we are absolutely heading into a recession and here's why. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, it's going to be a 40 minute speech. So obviously that's pretty quickly. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of other things too, but you, neither of you guys are, can challenge that at all. We are no. going into a recession, correct? Yeah, well, I put the chance at a 100% probability. Mm -hmm. that's well, even, even off the last PMI, the Chicago, I mean, Jeez. the Chicago print, the, the regional fed Chicago print, that printed at 37 this week. Every this is since 1970. Whenever that is printed below 40, it's been uh, every time a recession is followed. Yeah, I, I think that that all that's left is the uh, you know is the cleaning up the pieces. I think we're heading that way as well. It's really amazing to me too. And, and when you think about, first of all, it's not it's not surprising at all. They they basically told us that they were going to break down demand so quickly and so abrupt that they risked putting us into a recession, right? So that's what they're doing. Here we are. Mike, your screen was frozen, so I stopped the screen sharing. So whenever you guys want to go to the charts, go ahead. I'm going to look for that credit card thing in the back. Okay, let's, um, let's start to go to the bigger charts, too. You want to go to the S&P and tell me what you think? By the way, too, because I think that there's a bullish argument to be made for S&Ps and everything we were saying here. I think that mm -hmm. the bullish yeah. argument is that you know, Larry Kudlow and I always have this argument. And yes, I'm not above name dropping. We've had this argument for five years where he says profits are the mother's milk of stocks. And I say, no, Fed 
uh, you know, Fed liquidity is the mother's milk of stocks. And I think my side's more provable than his. Um, and I do think I see a scenario where within a month, maybe six weeks, that the Fed's like, oh, shit, things are getting bad. We're on pause. I think recent history backs you up. Yeah. So, Michael, what do we got here? Well, since last time we were on, we had that bullish pattern, the inverse head and shoulders trigger that hit the full target two days ago. However, based off the stats that I used back on the close of November 23rd, when we closed above 4,018, that signaled probabilities we, we could easily uh, reach this 4224 area. So it is still in bullish mode. Uh, it's still, even on pullbacks, it's in bullish mode. And, and as seen today, the pullback got quickly bought, came back to key support level into the, the rotation zone concept and rotated back up. So uh, if to get bearish, I mean, for me to get overly bearish to where I'm going to look to start selling stuff repeatedly, we'd have to get, there's so much support to chew through at this point. But until I get below about 37.30 on a daily closing basis, there is there, the probabilities do not shift to uh, to head lower to retest the lows. So, so, so tell me this. Do you then, just based on that, do you think we're heading to all-time highs or what are your objectives? No, no. The only thing that would shift to retest the – not all time highs, but retest the high area with a greater probability would be a weekly close above 4370. Okay, so that's that. I, I see exactly where that is. Right okay. here. Yeah, that's interesting. On the charts, everywhere up in here, though, up in here from the probabilities, uh, you know, even up approach to that 4224 area I talked about, there is a major potential rollover zone up here. Still, right. so you can approach this 4370 target and the closer you get, that doesn't signify, hey, that's let's try to front run this because up until that target is a major potential rollover zone. Interesting. Bobby, is the only fundamental argument or do you not want to talk? Are you still looking for the chart? No, I'm you good. can talk. Okay, I'm, good. I love that. I'm listening and looking. This is the only fundamental argument, the one I just gave that the Fed's going to flip and start throwing coals on the fire? Um, okay, so I had a, a conversation this week with Cameron D Dawson about this. Look at um, you, name dropper. I mentioned Larry Kudlow and you trump me. <laughs> Sorry, <trumps>. Larry. <laughs> I told her that her, her brain is just so significant. It's amazing. Compared to yeah. ours. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. she, she laid out three um, scenarios for me, and I thought it was super interesting. She's, number one is you get inflation with strong growth, even though the Fed's tightening. Obviously, the Fed doesn't cut in that scenario. This is, this is a Fed that's acting rationally. So let me throw out that disclaimer. Number two, you get a slowing economy with inflation still high. And obviously, why would the Fed cut? Because they're going to soak inflation. And if they try to fight it later, they're going to create another recession, right? And the third one being slow growth and lower inflation. Of those three, she thinks the last one is the least likely, at least in the short to medium term. So she says she sees the Fed just sitting. And she said, because this level of interest rates is really relative to long-term history, not that high. Now, I brought up to her, and I talked with Mike about this during the week. Uh, I wanted to send it to you, Jimmy. I should have. The amount of CEOs who are 40 to sub-40 in Fortune 500 and even early 40s is astounding, with Zuckerberg being the sort of poster child for it. Essentially, if Zuckerberg is 37 or 38 years old, he's literally never existed in an era where money costs anything, considering that money was 0% in 2008 when he was what, 19? I mean, right. I'm doing fast and poor math there. But they've never existed in a scenario where money has a cost or where inflation is a factor. Now, maybe inflation is a factor for a company like Facebook, but it's certainly a factor for the people buying their advertising. Sure. So I suspect it's the only long-term bullish argument, Jimmy. Um, yeah, what's I funny think... is that you said that rates historically are not that high. 
and I've argued, and I'm going to argue in, in this speech on Thursday too, is that in the period from early 80s to the great financial crisis, there was such a time of low inflation and there were several exogenous forces, not just uh, cheap labor from overseas, not just deregulating and privatization. There's things like the internet. There's all kinds of technological things that cause inflation. Lower. I will argue that, that um, the, uh, the government at all different levels tried to capitalize on this, increase regulation, increase taxes, almost to punitive levels. And it got to this unholy relationship with the corporate sector that the corporate sector needs lower rates or else the whole game crumbles. That hasn't changed. Those regulations and taxes are all still there. I personally believe that our corporate sector in this country needs low rates or else it's game over. And game, if game over has happened twice. I mean, the chair got pulled out from us in 08, chair got pulled out from us in, when was the tech, tech bubble bust? 01 or 99, even? 2000. Yeah, 99, 2000. So I think that we can't sustain higher rates unless we get a totally different style of government. And Carl Icahn came on to Trump's administration when he said, you know, there's 75 percent of the regulations that companies have to deal with are nonsense. And I'm for the environment. We go there every show yeah. for the environment. Yeah. But I think he's right. So I, I wonder how that's going to play out. But anyway, I think we're diverting. Yeah, I mean, just, I guess I just guess yeah. the caveat to that is throughout those periods of time, we did not have six percent, seven percent, eight percent inflation. We had like four and a half. Yeah, and, you know, they were able to, to hike rates pretty quickly. I, I'm not making a one to one direct cause that causal argument here but you know inflation was be not only able to get under control but again because of productivity gains due to things like the internet um it kind of took care of itself now we hope it'll take care of itself i think what's likely to happen and jimmy you've actually brought this up and i'm coming around to this kind of thinking is the fed is just going to say we've decided four and a half percent inflation is our new target then they don't yeah. have to do anything but i suspect that cuts are not coming you know i've always said that I thought 50, 25 and done for a while. Um, okay. I think the argument now becomes how long are they going to stay there? Right. And uh, you argue it's not going to be as long as I think. And I argue it's going to be a little longer than you think. And that's fine. And by the way, um, name drop alert. When I was talking with Joe Piscopo yesterday on his show, uh, I talked about um, you know, inflation. And this is everyone listen to this show. And Bobby makes this point all the time. The Fed still has designs on making the prices you pay for things go up still further from here. Yeah. Inflation coming down is the rate of increases coming lower. If right. you're expecting lower prices for things, you are out of luck. That's not going to happen very soon. I made a point again on Mike's uh, shows on, the, on our Path Trading Partners YouTube channel that food year over year is flat to negative in some small sectors of it but it was already up 30% a year ago. So right. when you're looking at year over year in food costs, you're actually seeing the base effects now. People are like, yeah, oh, Michael, it's not up. That's great, but it's still yeah, right. way higher than it was. Way, way higher and wages have not caught up. So we are going to live, and when I say we, it's always, by the way, the lower third. By the way, that's the thing that pissed me off the most because on Twitter, I argue about this bullshit about how these crappy policies, and then and people are like, oh, you know, you're just talking your book. No, I do fine in all these environments because you and I, we and we know how to trade around it. We know how to protect ourselves. We've had good fortune over the last 35 years. I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about not having people who are starving and rising up. Whatever. I'm getting a little out of the woods there. Sorry about that. But a good rant is good. Everyone's like, Mike Arnold, you still there? Did you go to sleep? No, I'm still here. Okay. Is there anything more you want to say about S&Ps? Yeah, I'm going to give my early warning sign. Good. Early warning sign, a, a daily close below 39.10 is an early warning sign. We could be in for some trouble below 39.10. Okay, so 39.10 is the wick of that one candle from, uh, you know, like two weeks ago, the bottom part of it. And it really what it is, it's below that whole consolidation pattern that takes about two weeks, correct? It's it's below the prior oh, major yeah, resistance yeah. becoming support. It's below the 50 exponential. It's back below the 50 retracement level that we passed from this down move. So that is still key from a harmonic standpoint. Okay. Uh, could, and could you we are in favor this, for me. Oh, sorry. sorry, go. And we're still in this climbing channel. And unless we were to break down the next few days, it will be then below the climbing channel line also. So that's the early warning. 
Okay, and before what we usually do on these shows, because we get so many new viewers every week, this the system we're talking about is essentially there's three moving averages that you like best. Go. What are they? Uh, the rotation zone is the 8 EMA and the 20 EMA. Key support resistance is the 50 EMA along with the 200 SMA, which is the red line. There's actually four lines on the chart. And why, by the way, Mike, do you use the EMA in, instead of the simple? I know the answer, by the way. Say it, because it tests out better. <laughs> because it tests out better. We're all about the probabilities and the testing. Yeah, we don't care why it works. We just know that it works. Exactly. Um, okay, that's interesting. Um, by the way, I want to move on. You guys remember that copper is the thing I've been beating the drum on. Silver was the thing I was yeah. beating the drum on. Can we do those things too? We sure. We got guys. I, mean, I found uh, a representation of consumer debt. I'm not finding the exact level of consumer debt, so I'm just going to steal the screen real quick. Sure. And talk about this for one second. Uh, let's see. Screen share. This is what I understand. I got to zoom in on it. Can you guys see this? Not yet. All right. Uh, says I'm sharing. Maybe Mike, can you stop sharing over there? Sure. Show you how good we are at our jobs here. Bingo. All right, can you guys see this yet? Yeah, I'm surprised that it's not higher. Okay, so this is household debt service payments as a percentage of disposable personal income. Okay. And it's spiking. Okay, it's, there's no it's question low. it's spiking. I yeah, thought it would have spiked. Yeah, it's low overall. Program. And you can see where it went during the pandemic and then it spiked and collapsed with the next pandemic payment. And right. now it's spiking again and there's no pandemic payments coming. So obviously this includes, uh, since this is household debt service, this includes mortgages and interest rates are still low through periods of this. I'm not finding just credit card debts. I'll have to get that. Um, sure. And by the way, and I, see if you agree with me. Right. Who, who, whose name did you drop? Nancy Davis. Right. You're going. You're you're winning still. <laughs> right? Oh, but I want to say some too. You said pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. I'm trying to change the verbiage going forward. And I think you agree with me on this. I always say post-lockdown, post-pandemic mitigation right, I'll do strategy. That. I'll okay, do that. good. Yeah, just because it, 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 there's so much bullshit involved in the whole thing. And if we in as it, going forward in history say that well, pandemic caused this, eh, not exactly true. The pandemic strategy. If you're saying that it's a hundred percent lock of what the government did compared to what was needed. Then we could say it was because of the pandemic. But anyway, hey, can I show you guys forward. something and then we'll go right back to Mike. This just, somebody just sent me this. Can you guys see this? Hold on, let me see. I'll read it out loud. What really happened <laughs> with the Hunter Biden story suppression on Twitter will be published on Twitter at 5 PM Eastern. That's from Elon Musk, huh? That's from Elon Musk. <laughs> Elon Musk is a lunatic. <laughs> and I'm starting to love him. <laughs> Hi, Mikey. I'm sorry. This will be Monday when this is released, so we're not breaking any news for anybody. So nobody may watch our podcast. <laughs> Let's go with copper, Michael. All right. I just had to share the screen again. Okay. Copper. Copper triggered the uh, buy signal back on the 11th of November, had a really nice pullback to a major significant level on, on the weekly of 355, touched it twice, forming a classic double bottom position, which triggered a couple of days ago. So if it wasn't triggered from before, you have a bullish pattern within a bullish pattern still it depends on the stop raise area, but this 394 area is going to be key. And on a break above there, we have the same key levels as before. Uh, 405, now we have a harmonic cluster. And then the next harmonic cluster is 417 to 48, 419. And then the final target is potentially back to 432, 433 area. Okay, so here's my question is that, and you guys who've watched this show before, you know, the copper's been my big thing for the next five years. That was my speech at the um, New Orleans Investment Conference. And so the question becomes again, 
be, saying something is a thing for the next five years and looking at this sort of technical analysis are obviously not a one-to-one. -one. But my question to Mike would be, could it be the big game on that I've been looking for? And in a longer term sense, do you think this is it's possible that this is the moment? Well, if now this is where the probability besides these shorter term patterns, and this can still take multiple weeks to play out to get back to that uh, 430. Let me see here. 432, 432.20, 432, 432.30 area. If you get a close above 432.40, that shifts your game on probabilities for a retest of potentially 480. So could this bullish pattern, the one that's been triggered, go up, hit the targets, reverse before getting that weekly close above 432.40 and come back down, yes. However, if you get that weekly close above 432.40, it's potential game on for a much more sustained, larger, longer term rally. Okay, Bobby, thoughts? Yeah, I like copper a lot. I mean, I, if I were putting on a trade, um, I probably wait for a break above that 200 there and yeah. take a pull take a pull back to that 200 if it held because it lines right up with that sort of uh late november high or mike has that level uh that'd right. be an ideal place for me if i saw it break above and then test it and it hold uh that would be a, a medium to long term long for me right there right and b of a by the way just came out with a a thing on copper two that basically just mirrored gold mirrored goldman's from a couple months ago mirrored mine as well and it was about the fundamental uh, structural deficits in copper and what could happen as we move towards electrification and decarbonization and all those crappy buzzwords that we're talking about too so i i definitely think like i'm going to be increasing my position in copper though it's already not uncomfortable but it's already a decent size for me but i, I think this for me over the next five years is what i'm potentially believe is a 3x trade Mark those words, you know, whatever. I've been wrong before. I don't care that much about being wrong. I mean, I don't put everything on one square ever, but this is something that I'm putting as a fairly high probability. And just to reiterate, because I always, I don't like to just put out some targets without knowing when it would be completely invalidated, would be a daily close below 337. Takes 337 it is the level? Okay, good. 337 is your critical level. Okay, cool. Uh, what do you want? Do you have something to go to next, Bobby? Because if it was up to me, I'd go to silver because silver was strong today. Let's even do, everything let's else do silver. And then I want to look at crude oil because I got a little bit of fundamental commentary on crude. But good. Let's do silver, though. Silver. Holy right. shit, by the way. <laughs> we, we, got, we got silver running. Uh, I mean, it's it. It's back above its 200, it clearly breakout. The only concern is short term in silver, we're getting to substantially very overbought levels. So I'm watching for a, a pullback or uh, from a short term breakout, a little minor trailing stop. But then we'll watch for another resurgence higher, especially if. Uh, especially if it's helped by the dollar breaking again lower but the key target area now for silver is 2387 and then the next target area the next major target is 2549 fantastic as most of you know too for the last year i've been overweight silver which was a fantastic position when the dollar was being destroyed up until the the Fed started hiking, and then I think my break even is about 50 cents higher than here. And again, this is an investment, it always was an investment. It's not one of those things that started as a trade and turned into an investment, which we all make fun of those things. But uh, to me, it was a big deal, and I still think it's an it's, I still think it's going higher fundamentally. Yeah, and he really want uh, it was interesting that silver took a little bit of a uh, I'm sorry, gold took a little bit of a hit today, but silver didn't, and that's obviously on the yield thing, which doesn't really affect silver anywhere near. Can gold. you explain that? Explain them a little bit more? Well, well, let me rephrase that. So the dollar weakness was based off of lower yields today. It's the stock mm -hmm. seemed to act like the Fed was going to get a little tighter over this non-farm. 
But again, we talk here and there that in many cases, bonds are smarter than stocks and yields on the bond market just kept going lower. Uh, Treasury futures just kept going higher, implying uh, that we're right about the conversation we had at the beginning of the podcast, that these numbers are crap and the feds are looking at the wrong numbers. So, I mean, if you see yields drop like this, gold becomes more attractive because one of the wraps against gold, um, one of the wraps against gold is that it doesn't provide a yield or a dividend like stocks do or treasuries do, uh, that is just a store of value. But if the Fed comes back with printing money or, or abandons any quantitative easing or anything like that, gold benefits. And that was the implication with the lower yields today. Stocks didn't trade like that. Uh, yeah. Silver, on the other hand, gold backed up a little bit because of this just pure equity sell off and gold hasn't really been a good flight to safety trade. It, it suffered very little today. But silver just kept going. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought that was nice. an interesting sort of dichotomy. Yep, it's a good day for me. So that's that's yeah. good. Yeah. Well, by the way, key line in the sand for silver is a weekly close back, back below twenty sixty four is is bad. Okay. Well, you will have to cancel the show if that happens because I'll be on a bender so bad that you guys won't even be able to find me. <laughs> so yeah. So as long as you don't see that close back below twenty sixty four, you're good to go, Jim. <laughs> okay. It's actually. Good. Let's actually shift gears to gold because, um, and then we'll go to crude because I have gold going to 2,800 next year, late next year. Ooh, look at right on the level here. Yeah, and that actually goes right to Jimmy's argument that the Fed's gonna be cutting rates aggressively. Uh, but it's for me, it's more based on a recession that the Fed can't really handle. And gold has been a good stagflation hedge, but not a good inflation hedge. And I still believe in stagflation. So um, I've got gold going at 2,800 and, and my money's where my mouth is in physical gold, as you both know. Mm -hmm. What do you think, so Michael? Let's see what the short to medium term, according to Mike, is on gold. Let's, well, I'm gonna give the next key, uh, hold on one second. The next key, uh, if we do, I mean, we got a lot of resistance to chew through first. I mean, the next, the next key target is 1958 on a more sustained rally, and then it would be to take out the most recent highs, and then the two key levels are 2219 and 2350. And if you really want the next major level, you're making me work for it, aren't you? You're making me work for my my for your no money. <laughs> yeah, for my no money. <laughs> for your zero money. <laughs> your zero dollars that we pay you to do this. I, well, by the way, we're gonna give you a hundred percent raise for this. Yeah. A hundred percent raise. It's a math joke, people. <laughs> <laughs> I think jokes are so much better when you explain them afterwards. Well, if you have to explain it. No, no, that? that's wrong. Explaining it's awesome. <laughs> Our, ah. Come on. Anchor. There we go. All right. The next major harmonic 20, uh, harmonic target is 2540. And you see, I listed that prior to 2317 to 23. 40 area is a cluster now, and then your next major target is 2540. Mm -hmm. So if you're a real super duper long-term gold bug, that is your key areas that could be at least used to raise trailing stops. Yeah, I'm becoming one. I'll tell you some old, old school technical analysis that I did for years and years and years were just trend lines and defining points and then the next area of space. So if you look at a weekly chart, we are approaching a weekly defining point of a downward sloping trend line that starts the week of the 7th, March 7th, okay? So there's a spike high there the week, at, the week of March 7th, all right? And the defining point for that trend line is the high on the week of August 15th. And we're approaching that. So, Jimmy, this is old school stuff I taught with Mike and sure. I first met. And he's like, I really like this. 
here's 20 other things we should be showing as well. So <laughs> I've, we've kind of abandoned this a little bit, but just for basic technical analysis, when you break a trend line, that's not actually a break of a trend uh, based on my research that Mike agreed with. The break of a trend is a break of a defining point. All it really means is you have to redraw the trend line. Like it might cause a flatter, I'm sorry, a yeah, flatter trend line. So a less aggressive downtrend, all right? So gold has been on a weekly downtrend uh, since about that week of March 7th, right? right? So the defining point of that trend line is Mike just pointed to it there is the week of August 15th. Now, if we can- Okay, good. I was hoping line, you'd mention that point, right? Yeah. So that's the defining point of the trend line. So these are actual technical terms Mike and I coined. So it's an initiating point and a defining point. So now we have a valid downward sloping trend line. The next target would be the end of the clear path uh, to the left there, which would be the close of the week of the 20, what is that? January 3rd, 3rd what is third or 13th, Mike? The yeah, next one. It's actually, um, Mike the, would go the to the lower of, one. But I would go to the top of that red candle. That, as that's my, the open of the 13th. Right, but it lines June, right not up. January. It lines right up with one of Mike's levels, interestingly enough. With that the harmonic. harmonic. The harmonic, right? So that's my yep. first short-term target on gold is right there. And then if that happens and we get a rotations down, then we would redraw the trend line somewhere in that area and start the cycle again. So Mike, if you could just fake redraw the trend line somewhere in that area, let's say that next week's candle goes there. This is a quick lesson on simple trend line theory, right? It'd be somewhere around there, okay? Right. That would be the new trend line if we get a move up there and then a move down after it, okay? Mm -hmm. So now the next target becomes the top of the opening of the candle for the week of January, now is that April? That is April, April 18th. 18th. That would become the next target and you step up from there. If you break right. that one, you're now the downtrend's over on a weekly basis. So you kind of get these trend lines that are steep, flatter, 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 broken. So that's the, the process we go through and it's a conservative and reliable way to work with trend lines. But the first job one is to get us a settlement above the green and red candle from uh, go back, yeah, right there, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like that a lot. Then that is major, major resistance because that's the area of support back from May that was formed. We got the little bounce and then took that out, retested in August, and then had the substantial sell-off. So a a weekly close above there would be substantial uh, breaking of that resistance and potentially making it. Uh, key support on any retest. Right. And, and from if you if you put a gun to my head and said, you have to make a short term trade on gold, I'd actually short it with a stop mm. above there. Who here disagrees or agrees? No, I, I agree with that. Yeah, right. Okay. So you yeah. held a gun to my head. Right. Yeah, very short term. I mean, very short term. This is we've got cycles at the top. We're back to overbought with setting up a momentum divergence, which favors a pullback trade in the short term. Right. So, okay. yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's not shocking, but you know, a lot of times I'll, we're against this key resistance too. A lot of times we'll see things stall out up here because the first the first attempt at it doesn't generally make a sustaining move. The second or third attempt above there, generally if it's gonna break that ceiling and turn it into a floor, that's when we get the sustaining move. So I would actually prefer a pullback E easily to the daily rotation zone. And that one could be a signal then on a, on a, another shorter term system for another reload buy. Nice. Yeah. By the, so way, the you reason mentioned I bring this up and yeah. the reason I say that twice is because my position in gold is physical gold. Yeah. So that I totally agree with you on a short term. Um, I would be more in the short camp if we get a, a failure here. So as Byron Wien always says, if you're going to have physical gold, you might as well have a gun because if you're going to need the gold, you're going to need the gun. And my guess is you probably still appreciate well. you don't have to make margin on it. So <laughs> exactly. Right. And when they come go to take it away, like they did back in the thirties, uh, you just say, you know, no, I don't, I don't have gold. Yeah, <laughs> right? then so, I, I actually do have guns. So then those come yeah. into play. 
yeah. goes coming to play. And by the way, back when they made gold illegal to hold, was who was that? FDR? Yeah. Like who who were the who were the people who trotted in and turned in their gold? Like what what is wrong with people? Imagine <laughs> if their family had it now. Yeah, yeah, it's unbelievable to me. What are we gonna go to next? Oil? Yeah, oil, please. All right, Mikey, have at it. Uh, long term, we're still in a downtrend uh, triggered trade that was triggered back on August 1st and hit the first target part way to the second target, which is still right in front of 70. And then the eventual final target is roughly 65 to 62. Short term, we have a confirmed double bottom, but not triggered double bottom. So that oh, is the only that thing I'm keeping again, will you, Mike? What was that? Can you explain that concept again? Confirmed double bottom, oh. but not a triggered double bottom? Well, any pattern, we generally have a move that confirms it. In this double bottom pattern, we needed any trade above 8236 would confirm it as a valid pattern. Where are the, the two trigger bottoms? For, huh? Where are the two bottoms? One, two. Okay. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. On the so got it. that is... So this confirmed it back uh, yesterday, December 1st, confirmed the trade. It has not obviously triggered. You see, it's we have the concept we've talked about before with the rotation zone, went up, closed in the rotation zone, and now it's rotating back down. Now, if we do get the close above that 20, uh, or sorry, 82.36, at this point, the rotation zone will now be out of the way. So that could be a quick pop back to potentially the full targets are 89.45. Does that take you to new highs or even new breakout highs? Uh, it has not triggered yet. And if it does not trigger, we're rotating back down and we could, if, you know, Bob's got some fundamentals, but if, if, we don't get any bullish fundamentals kicking in soon. We could then retest the longer term down move target of 70 bucks. So this is a good time to talk about something that, that Mike and I teach, mostly Mike, is what happens is oftentimes less important than where it happens, okay? It's a very uh, fundamental reason why we use closes as opposed to just breaks to trigger patterns. So if you zoom back in on this double, right? The double is there. It's legitimate. It is a high probability double bottom by the way we calculate them. But the rotation zone, which would imply a short position if it were to trigger, is in the way of this. So if you would have closed into, I'm sorry, closed above the trigger point for the double, the rotation zone is then out of the way and not a hindrance to you moving to your target, right? The fact that this double bottom happened in the midst of a rotation zone down is really, really critical here. And when you see those kinds of things lined up, it's like, okay, so this is kind of taken care of for me because the rotation zone is below the level I needed to close above. It didn't. So the rotation zone is still the dominant force in the, in the pattern or in the two patterns that arrive. This is what Mike means by oftentimes what happens is less important than where it happens in price action. It's a, it's so a great concept. When you guys, the rotation zone is a very similar concept to the Ichimoku clouds, right, Michael? Somewhat. It, Somewhat. You can tie them together roughly, yeah. They're the cousins, let's call them. Yeah. Okay. We, that, that, yeah. yeah. So right. it's what just else? areas we keep an eye on because there's pro when running the probabilities, it's areas you need to consider to watch when you're trading into for the shorter term move, which has been down besides these four up days we've had a we've been trading back down so this is an area that if it's going to fail on the counter move this little up move it would fail somewhere between these this eight right. ema and the right. but based EMA. on the moving averages is what i meant right yeah, yeah. yes Got it. so real quick on the fundamental side it, it, it's oh, interesting mike if you can put the weekly back up it's interesting how this stuff works there were very few people that believed uh, me when I said it, and 
the reason I said it, and I've, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but it's worth mentioning again. Oftentimes when I'm, I'm debating myself on a fundamental pattern, or I'm sorry, a fundamental idea, I look at the charts and I say, okay, what are, what are the charts implying? Are the charts implying that price is going to go up or down? And this weekly double had triggered the last time I had this kind of sort of argument with us, with ourselves, this weekly double top. And I said, okay, this is implying prices in the 60s. So I'm going to start telling people that I think 65 before 105. And Jimmy, if you remember, we had the podcast with uh, Tracy Shukart. And she was like, well, I don't really know about that for this reason and that reason. She's much smarter than me in fundamentals. And I did a Twitter space with her this week uh, with some other oil experts. And, um, you know, I reiterated some of the fundamental thesis behind lower prices and people are starting to agree. And I'm actually, I'm being self, uh, self deprecating here. It wasn't that I was smarter about the fundamentals at all. I just couldn't ignore what's on the screen right now. So I said, even though I think the upward fundamentals are stronger, I got to go with the downward fundamentals because this is such a reliable pattern you know, upwards in the 60 and 70% re reliability when it's structured correctly. So right now you've got an OPEC meeting on Sunday, right? We're closing crude oil today somewhere around 80 bucks. I, I don't know exactly where, right? Um, if we're around 80 bucks, there is really no pressure for OPEC considering that their actual production was the lowest since the pandemic. I'm sorry, since the lockdowns. And their actual production was already well below where they should be. And refiner realization hit over 95 today. That's the highest level since August of 2019. Refinery utilization at 95 is full capacity. So if we start to see big gasoline builds and distillate builds, which we saw this past week, along with that high refinery utilization, prices keep going lower on a fundamental basis in the short to medium term. Now I suspect that OPEC plus has exactly no incentive to get let prices go too much lower. So the closer we get to that $65 target, the less comfortable I get with it. But that's kind of really the case with every damn trade that I do. I'm not sure of this, by the way, that's just my opinion. You, you didn't mention any sort of SBR restocking. Does that come into play at all? Um, I don't think they end up restocking if prices are going to be lower. So if the government says, we're gonna buy oil from you, at $70, they probably do it at $70 if prices are more at 65, Got right? It. So, yeah. um, because then they're making a spread. Right. So I, it, it does, but even with that, you know, we all made a big deal, including myself, that that was just poor policy, but even that is not enough to affect a downward sloping market. And again, with the lows that we had at seventy three dollars, we're only eight dollars away from that target. So, right. and we hit the first target, as Mike would say, the highest probability targets the first target. So, we may have already successfully completed the pattern. Uh, two things I'd like to add to what Bobby said, and you guys who, who watch this a lot, like our, our tech for us both, and I think I speak for you as well. If our technical thesis is strong, it can swamp our fundamental thesis. Absolutely. If our fundamental thesis is strong it cannot knock out our technical thesis. That's correct, right? Yes, agreed. And Michael even tell you, he doesn't really care what my fundamental thesis is. He finds <laughs> it interesting to talk about, but yeah, for you and no, I, but Jimmy, I think, absolutely. And I appreciate the purists out there too, but I think you, you, most traders do themselves a little bit of a disservice if they don't think about the fundamentals. And I, I don't know, again, maybe just that looking at technicals doesn't occupy our time all day. We need something else to, I, I don't know what function it serves, but my copper thesis from you know a month ago was largely fundamental. Then I waited for technical, but I, I think they both fit in somehow too. Yeah, they're good. But what, what other uh, do you think do you want to look at? Mike, dealer's choice I'm or good. Bobby, what do you got? I'm actually good, unless you guys have something. I mean, is it worth looking at, at treasuries? Well, look at it real quick and months. then we'll call it a day. What'd you say? Let's look at the notes real quick yeah, sure. because yeah. I got, I took a ton of heat for this one. Not in the, in, <laughs> not from a trading perspective, but we had this, we had this double bottom trigger, you know, back uh, 10th of November, multiple ways to get in. And everybody said, this is, there's no way this is going to these targets back, you know, three, four weeks ago. Well, First target hit, second target hit within within shooting distance of the final target. So <laughs> beautiful. 
Yeah. I don't know what to say. That's why I have to, you know, if you had asked me fundamentally, did I think the notes would rally this far this fast? I would have said no. But the, the technicals were, were to trade. It, it, yeah. Where do I go from that? Do I then start second guessing? I mean, no, not any trades 100%. But the probabilities lined up to a certain, the, to a very reliable percentage that, okay, I don't know how it's going to work out, but hey, we got to go with it. And two of the three targets are hit. And it became, it, this could easily still get hit by early next week. You know, Scotty well, Nations once said to me that, when I showed him a chart, he's like, that just looks like a bunch of lines and squiggles to me. Well, so is Linguini. And I love Linguini. So I'm going with it. Did you say that on the spot or did you think of that as you were walking away? I thought of it as I was walking away. Shit. Very, I actually didn't say it to Scotty because he just would have shook his head because he's just way smarter than me and better than me. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's, if, so what yield does you represent? Where did the tens close yield-wise? Let's see. Let's see where the tens are. Because the tens in the yield was fantastic. You see the double top pattern in the yield because, again, the inverse relationship. And look at that. The yields already went through all the targets. So, uh, you know, there, I got it. trade, trade. And by the way, from a yield perspective, you have major support at uh, 343 is very major support. I'm going to add something about yields, and I'm, I'm curious. I think, Bobby, you'll agree with me, too. Nowhere as much in any other asset do big round numbers mean as much in yields. And it's not an accident. It's not psychological. It's option positioning. When people go and put on long-term trades, they don't target uh, you know, 3.68. They target 3.75. Um, they like to target big numbers. So I always take the psychological levels with much more importance. And I just noticed that it's hovering around three and a half. And, you know, I know there was options expiry today, but I mean, just a day, just a weekly, but well, so to, your I think point, Jimmy, to your point, yields closed at 351. So that's basically, okay. I got to Have you thought about that before, Bobby? Do you, do you agree with me? Yeah, I do agree. I got to piss. Okay. That sometimes you have to I, remember on this show, we tend to drink alcohol. So if this happens, it happens. Uh, Michael, do you want to do anything else? Or do you want to call it a day? Uh, I'm just, let me just get check out my list real quick just to see if I'm overlooking anything. Uh, real, I mean, just well, the from, dollar. I want to look at the dollar yeah. too. Good call. The, the dollar, I mean, it's sitting at such a critical level right here. Let me pull off some of these lines. The dollar is sitting at a major key area. So we have this 104, 104 to 104.20. We have the 50, weekly 50 exponential moving average. We have key harmonics right there. If we break down more, you could see a quick trip back to 102, which, you know, then that's, that's going to keep your metals chugging along right there but this is a very critical area that we're looking to close the week right at and we are major oversold with cycles at the bottom so if we get a bounce off these levels which would not surprise me the strength of the bounce is going to tell us a lot in terms of the long-term uh trend for the dollar and, and by the way guys this is, I guess, we, we almost skipped this chart, which is a shame because this is this is everything we've talked about yeah. is encompassed in this thing here. So if if we break that level, that will by definition have to mean that the Fed is is changing their stance somehow. And if we have a extended move lower, it means that the Fed is acknowledging some of the economic problems we we started off the show talking about. Um, you agree with that, right, Michael? Oh, yeah. Yes. If the, I, I mean, it's definitely a shift in narrative. I would not be surprised to see some kind of bounce rally to set up a big macro head and shoulders pattern. A so you, you mentioned a, a, a overbought position, an overbought, uh, oversold position twice. When I hear that, I think 
doesn't change the trend. It's just going to give you a better opportunity to get in, correct? Correct. And that does not mean just because something's oversold, we all know it can continue to get more oversold. Amen. However, yes. when I have something that oversold against key support with cycles, with the timing cycles at the bottom, it does not mean I just want to, to mortgage the house and go all in on short on the US dollar just yet. It's Amen. okay. Let's watch for this bounce. And this, the, the technical patterns that set up on this bounce are going to tell us a lot and possibly set up a major dollar topping trade. Okay, got it. I like this. So that's where I'm going to be keeping an eye on mostly going forward is this chart. I'm going to have that up every day, which I always do. I have, I have Euro, Sterling, Canada, um, you know, all the uh, components of the index. Uh, sometimes I don't have the index up itself. But I think that's all a big, huge deal. Let's call it. Is well, that now, okay? on. Hmm? Yeah, Go we're on. good. One of the first chart, I always have my chart rotation. And that's the climb, the charts that have climbed to the top. I mean, the dollar's right there. It's literally, good. I wake up, I'm looking at the dollar index. Because that's going to tell me, it's going to tell me a lot about the equities. It's going to tell me about the Bought the bot treasuries and it's going to tell me about metals so right yeah. there I, I already have i have my work cut out amen. of me just watching the dollar amen no question about it i think that that's a wise thing to do again and that goes back to even the stock market it's not necessarily about profits it's about the fed baby it's always about the fed good voice exactly. yeah we're good i was uh Sorry, I had to go piss, but I was done with my Manhattan, so I just started drinking this. Oh, fantastic. Nice. By the way, I, do you guys know what this is? No. That's when the blackjack dealer leaves the table. Yeah, when he... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, so he's not, he's trying not to make it my sleeping signature in cards. What? Yeah, exactly. You don't want to sleep the cards exactly. and the chips. Yeah, I'm trying to make it my signature move. You That's like it, it or I'm, not? I'm renaming you Jimmy Blackjack. That's it. <laughs> see, see you boys. Have a good weekend. See you guys. Cheers, you everybody. Too.